Hi, and welcome to Truth Be Known. This is Lauren Vaccarello, Chief Marketing Officer at Talent. On today's episode, we talk to Greg Kerala, Director of Analytics at Amazon Web Services. When talking to Greg, I was reminded of the story of the boy with his finger in the dike. If you haven't heard it, it's an old fable from the Dutch city of Harlem. The city's near the coast and is technically below sea level. And the only thing that keeps the sea at bay are these giant walled embankments called dikes. In this legend, a young boy is walking by the dike one day when he notices that water's leaking out through a small crack and the pressure is creating cracks, threatening to destroy the dike and flood the entire town. The boy sticks his finger in the dike to stop the leakage and he calls for help, but no one can hear him. So he stays all night with his finger in the dike in order to save the town. I was reminded of this story because AWS is the boy with his finger in the dike of the internet. Amazon Web Services maintains the cloud storage for something like 40% of the internet. It's not recognized in the general population, but AWS keeps the world running. And like the fabled Dutch boy, if you removed it, you'd have massive chaos. And that's the reason this conversation with Greg was so interesting. It's because in that context, the decisions you make and how you make them are so important. The effects are felt everywhere by people throughout the world. It doesn't get much more high stakes than that. So let's get into it. Without further ado, welcome to Truth Be Known. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Truth Be Known. We have Greg Corrala from uh, AWS here with us today. Greg, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks. Happy to be here. We are really, really excited. AWS is doing some really, really incredible things. I love that we get to have you on the show to talk about you, your world, your history, and learn more about AWS today, too. Great. Looking um, forward to it. Before we get started, um, can you tell everyone a little bit about you and about how you got started in tech? Sure. So um, I currently uh, live in Scottsdale, Arizona. I uh, love the warmth, the heat. After being in Seattle for a while, we were super excited to uh, see the sun consistently. So we moved uh, recently uh, from, from Seattle to Scottsdale. Um, but I've had a, a varied career across technology. So I've been at AWS about uh, seven and a half years now. Um, before that, I spent some time at Intel as well as Oracle. Um, but prior to that, I actually was an undergraduate at the University of Dayton in Ohio where I was, uh, had an ROTC scholarship from the Army. So after college, I went off and I served on the U.S. Army for four years. Um, and nothing kind of, you know, um, brings together focus like, like being in the Army, I guess. And at some point I was like, huh, there's got to be more, uh, you know, brain power potentially I could use. And so uh, got super interested in technology. And then I went to uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, for a master's degree in information systems. And uh Ever since then, I've just been real passionate around data analytics and, and really the decision making that goes around um, analytics as well. Oh, that's awesome. Um, there's a lot of great CMU alums out there too. So, that's right. Yeah, um, the Tartans. <laughs> is the I feel like I feel like you guys gravitate towards tech a lot. <laughs> that's right. Um, so flash forward to where we are today. What is your, tell us about what you do at AWS every day. Sure. So today I'm a director of analytics at AWS. And so my team uh, leads our go to market strategy for AWS analytics services. Uh, these include data warehousing, uh, big data, streaming processing. So kind of a rich collection of, of analytics services that are really you know, built and, and purpose around delivering value from customers' data. Uh, one of the big changes we've seen, you know, going back even, you know, five years ago, let alone 10 years ago, was customers typically collected data from their customer relationship management system or enterprise resource planning. And this data was highly structured and, you know, data sizes were, were pretty moderate, maybe tens of terabytes of data. Whereas today in our you know, modern uh, you know, internet of things driven world, you know, customer data comes from you know, social media, sentiment data, all these new sizes of data that have just vastly different scale. And, and more and more customers want to become data driven, meaning 
you know, making decisions based upon insights from all this new data. And so my team primarily helps customers along this journey. And then as they move from on-premise to the cloud, you know, what's the right pattern to be able to get the most value from their data? And, and my team is really focused on helping customers along, along that journey. And I, so you've been at, you've been at AWS for, you said seven and a half years. And I think we're all familiar with AWS today, which is the, you know, category leader growing crazy fast and has completely changed our approach to databases, to storage. You've uh, so responsible for moving so many businesses to the cloud, but seven and a half years ago, Amazon wasn't really known for, Amazon wasn't really known for this seven and a half years ago. Um, what's it been like to be part of this transition and this journey? Yeah, it's been, been a great a great journey. I, I've learned a ton. I've really appreciated my, my direct interaction with our customers to help me uh, learn from them as well. Uh, but I think the, the biggest change in thinking back, you know, seven years ago, cloud was just something that um, wasn't very well understood. Uh, infamously and famously, perhaps, you know, Larry Ellison uh, talked about, you know, his, his viewpoints on the cloud. But really what, what I saw the value and what attracted me the most was not just cost savings and, and uh, moving kind of off on-premise to get rid of the data center business, which is, there's some value, economic value to that. But what I kind of saw early trends are, and, and a light bulb went off, is that you know, there's just a fundamental way that we could make innovation to be the center of our data decision making. And just thinking about some of the innovators like Airbnb or Pinterest that were born in the cloud, um, at the time they were pretty small, you know, moderate sized, but, you know, I just felt there was something there in terms of the agility and innovation that, you know, really any, any enterprise worldwide could take advantage of. And, you know, I just had this feeling that it was super early, but, you know, the trend line in my mind was, was pretty clear and I wanted to be part of the team that could bring that, that ability to innovate to our customers worldwide. No, that's awesome. And I I love what you said about innovation being at the the center of the center of de- decision making. It's it's something I think a lot of us take. I think something a lot of us take for granted. Um and this ability to see where the what's the the Wayne Gretzky phrase? Look where the puck is going. And that's just right. this is where we are going and the world is fundamentally changing and it's not there today, but I, I have full faith that this is what's happening. That's right. And I think uh, um, really what I've benefited personally from the most is just hearing from customers worldwide. I've had the, the, the real honor of, of meeting customers, not just in North America, but you know, in India and China and Korea, uh, Australia. And you know, what's the common patterns around getting value from data and being able to serve their customers better. And really just hearing like this commonality across the challenges, regardless of geography or industry, of course, bringing their uniqueness to their markets has been a real uh, personal insight to me as I've, I've thought about how that applies to our, our broader customer base as well. Awesome. And there, there is so much power from being able to access all of your data, to know what's going on, to make, to make, in so many ways, just business changing and industry changing decisions. And do you have, I know you mentioned you've met customers all over the world. Do you have any um, favorite customer stories you can share about how they've used AWS, used data and just made a big impact? Yeah, I think w- there's there's so many of them. I mean, oftentimes we have a bit of a recency bias, but one of the ones, you know, that's top of mind to everyone has been um, our, our work with Moderna around developing uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. And just really, you know, think about how quickly they had to uh, react, uh, stand up um, their, not just research and development, but also manufacturing. And uh, in our AWS reInvent customer conference uh, last week, uh, virtually online, uh, we talked a little bit with Moderna about the core role that not just innovation, but also being able to use the flexibility of cloud computing to really scale to the demand. And, and we're certainly thankful for the dedication uh, the researchers at Moderna has to deliver, you know, what hopefully will be a vaccine to our, our current uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis or worldwide. Now, and it's, 
That's amazing. And it really is that power of the ability to scale up and scale down at at need and at the drop of a hat that just didn't exist before AWS came out. That's right. I mean, one other, you know, quick story I'll tell, this goes back a few years ago. And one of the powers of, of cloud computing is just really the, the removing of barriers to this, uh, you know, vast computing power. And uh, at the time uh, I was a um, business development manager for our relational database service on the Postgres database. And we had a customer in Brazil call us and say, hey, like we run the national testing for, the, for all of Brazil. And we want to move our uh, effectively the equivalent of the SAT in America to RDS Postgres. And you know, our test is in a couple of weeks, and we're gonna, you know, go from our usage of five databases to about five thousand databases over the weekend and then turn everything off. And of course, you know, we had wished that maybe they had reached out to us a little bit earlier, but just so we could prepare and do some testing with them. But in fact, they did that and they were super successful. And just think about you know, uh, going from very small uses to very big and then back down to zero is just really pretty incredible versus the past where you would have had to provision for the full capacity for that, right? And I think it's just a, it's a great story that, that, I, that always resonates with me about how, you know, this power of cloud computing and variability of demand can really be applied worldwide as well. It is, and it's the doing this across borders and doing this easily across borders is, incredible and it's so much of where the the world is going and i feel like aws has given this power to businesses of all sizes you're not just you're not hamstrung because you don't have a, a huge budget and a huge it team to set a lot of this up that's right and just thinking about the last uh you know seven and a half years at aws um, it's interesting at the first couple of years you know many of my conversations with customers were startups right Mm -hmm. Very small, very agile, you know, three to five person teams, because um, they really were able to get the, the full capability of not just uh, computing power, but also tools like an enterprise data warehouse. And, you know, back when I first joined in, in 2012, we launched a new service called Amazon Redshift mm -hmm. that really, you know, I would say changed the market for data warehousing, because now if I was the startup or small customer, um, I could, you know, leverage the power where perhaps it would have taken tens, if not hundreds of people to manage and, and millions of dollars potentially to have this power of analytics in a data warehouse. But, you know, I could have it in a matter of minutes, if not seconds. And the type of insights that were driven, I think, was really, really unique. And we're um, really, you know, excited to see how that has evolved into, um, you know, getting more value from your data across enterprise customers worldwide as well. Definitely. And it is the, I remember the the first time I became a, an AWS customer, it was when I was running marketing at a startup and it was, of course we use AWS. This is, this is what you do to spin things up. And now it's um, so, so much far beyond the sort of startup spinning things up. And you're right. It is the, the power of data in getting that instant access to data, to analytics, to getting that usefulness out of it since, um, it really is what we can do with data and the actions we take from it that is what holds the most of its power. Yep, couldn't agree more. Um, so we're gonna get to the fun part of the, not that all of the interview is not fun, um, or not all the podcast isn't fun, but um, I would love to dig into um, some of the hardest decisions you've had to make. And I know you and I have talked a little bit about this, but um, I think you've got such an interesting perspective. Uh, can you tell me about, uh, in your current role, what's the hardest decision you've had to make? Sure, it, it comes back to a little bit I was talking about where you know, we saw customers moving from on-premise to the cloud. You know, initially, cost savings was, was a really big driver, but you know, when they move from an on-premise data warehouse or they perhaps have an on-premise Hadoop cluster, in many cases, they found you know, that they were simply recreating data silos, meaning that, that the, the team that was working with structured data from the relational data sources into a data warehouse or streaming data into a data lake, they still were building like these different silos of data. And then we started to see a trend with some of our more innovative customers as we were looking across uh, their usage patterns where you know, the top, let's say, Amazon Redshift customers are also top users of Amazon EMR, which is our Apache Hadoop 
um, uh, distribution. And so we're kind of thinking and, and kind of, you know, how we position, how we market, how we think about talking to customers. And it has evolved into a, a pretty big shift where instead of thinking about marketing Redshift or EMR, where now we, we talk more about building a lake house architecture on AWS. And with the lake house, um, it's a bit of a pivot from our marketing for sure, but really wants to position the value of data and not the fact that your data resides in one database or another. And how do we break down the data silos of a data warehouse and a data lake, breaking down and combining the value of structured data around customers, their purchases and whatnot, but also what are they doing on social media or sensor data, you know, log data. And, and what's a, you know, a way that we can focus on how a data worker or a persona at a customer like a data scientist or data analyst can get value of the data regardless of where it resides. And this did require um, you know, a bit of investment, a pivot of us thinking not just about features in our services to support this, but also how we communicate the customers, our presentations, and really our whole go-to-market strategy to help unlock the, the value of data across these diff different areas. Yeah, and then for, for people who are less familiar with um, data lakes and lake houses and data warehouses, can you, can you tell us a little bit more about each? Sure, so a, a, a data warehouse was really um, developed to help decision-making. And so thinking about you know, all the places we capture data, at the end, they end up being mostly in relational databases historically. So this could be sales information, purchase information, but then if I wanna understand you know, what are sales across a number of years, across different geographies, uh, there was a whole um, industry that built up around answering these analytic type questions. And it turned out the data structures that were available for transaction processing aren't always you know, um, the best for decision-making. And so an entire industry led by the likes of Teradata and Atiza and Oracle built up around this concept of a data warehouse. In fact, there's many, many books and things that are written around this. But to build a data warehouse, you have to you know, think about a data model and think carefully about how data is loaded and tuning, who's accessing it. Well, on the side, you know, particularly in the early 2000s or so, and moving forward, you know, I'm sure some folks have heard of Apache Hadoop. Uh, there was this alternative market that, that today we refer to as a data lake, but was really built around the new data. So this is log data, social media data, data that doesn't come from a relational database, but is simply gathered through different sensors. And so oftentimes a data lake is really meant to refer to this unstructured data, which really just says it doesn't fit neatly into this structured schema that we might have in a data warehouse. And again, you know, there's entire like, industry, some of the leaders like Cloudera, for instance, that led the Apache Hadoop and, and Hortonworks that kind of were early, early innovators in this space, but still what customers found was like these two areas, the, the data warehouse, the data lake, the highly structured data, the unstructured data, you know, in the end that there's, there was a lot of value in combining these, and how do we make that easy and seamless to be able to get, you know, a full view of customers? So sometimes you think about having a 360 degree of customer across social media, their purchases and their history. And that's really what, what our concept of the lake house and our customers get value from data is, is centered around. And I, I think that brings up so many interesting points. And it's the, again, it's thinking about where the world is going and the realization that just because we it's easier for us to keep structured data in one place and unstructured data in another place almost treats it like people are two different people if you're thinking of a customer 360 or whatever problem you're trying to solve it is independent versus the reality of it is you know as a consumer we live in both structured and unstructured data we live in the crm systems and the erps but we also live in our interactions on social media on all of the cell data that I know is being sort of uh, pumped everywhere right now of where we are from a location perspective and to really make great business decisions you need the ability to combine that structured and unstructured to find out really what's happening that's right and I think if, you, if I always kind of think about in my personal life like how has my interactions with data personally changed and mm -hmm. You know, uh, sometimes to the detriment of, of my rest of my family, I get accused of, of holding my cell phone and, and looking down at my screen all uh, too often. But 
just think about the richness of data and and everything from my you know ring camera to um, it turns out my my new refrigerator actually has um, the ability to connect through Wi-Fi so we can set the temperature. I mean, just in our own interaction and, and having that real time um, interaction is, has become a new standard for customer service, for instance, right? You know, nothing is more frustrating if, if you call in or make a request for a service from a, one of your um, providers that you work with and you have to restart from scratch. And so, you know, I think part of this is this drive to really bringing up, you know, the standards of interaction across multiple channel, channels. And of course, this is where, you know, data becomes at the heart of it all and the privacy of that data and how the data is used become top of mind around data governance that, that really, you know, we've been working hard at AWS to make that easier for customers, you know, of any size to be able to ad adapt to this new world where on-demand information, mobile devices, and a, and a keen sense of privacy and security are top of mind of, of, of consumers today. So it's interesting is I had um, a really great conversation with someone who leads analytics at a at a stay lauder. And uh, one of the things that this makes me think about on the combining structured and unstructured data and the impact that it has on your ability to serve and to serve a business is, you know, in this post COVID world, people aren't going into stores. Like, we're not going into stores. So for a company like Estee Lauder, or for pretty much every business, you have to rely on data probably more now than you did before because we have to figure out how to react. So they have to pull in all of their structure, all of their structure data, everything they can from a social media perspective from to start to understand what are consumer trends, how do they need to change product, what products they're selling, how do they need to adapt, um, what marketing materials they have, and how do they um, continue to grow a business where the entire model has changed overnight. And one thing that I think is super interesting about them is how much their e-commerce business has grown That's and right. how they've, they had a good trajectory for growing e-commerce, but now I, I can't remember the exact year, but they've reached their e-commerce revenue goals years ahead of where they anticipated because of this power of, and they've got a brilliant team over there, but this ability to look at data, tie in tons of different data sources and be able to make these rapid decisions. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, and again, just thinking about my own you know, family's personal journey, just the, the rise of using a mobile app, you know, on, on in our case, our iPhones to order everything from beer, wine, groceries, uh, you know, um, all the kind of staples and, and, and including, you know, we had to recently replace our refrigerator and so, you know, just think about like, so you, you know, if you didn't have a mobile application, um, you know, a year ago or six months ago, like you, it's, it's a cost of doing business today, right? Yep. If you don't have good line of sight into your inventory and your distribution facilities, your production facilities, and, and of course, all throughout that, keeping health and safety front of mind, um, you know, you're, you're really on the path to not being in business, right? And, and you didn't have years to plan for this. And so, um, I think like this, you know, rise of of self service, you know, primarily, you know, through some kind of mobile app, and then what that means for your back end infrastructure for manufacturing, quality, inventory, I think is really really been a game changer. And I I think that um, if there is such a thing as a positive um, um, thing from our our current situation, it's that it's really accelerated a lot of adoption and and focusing on what the ways customers want to buy, and of course as things get better. Hopefully we'll go back to stores, but I really question if it'll ever go back to the way it was. And just, you know, my own personal interactions with, with purchasing online and having groceries delivered has, has fundamentally changed my expectation as a consumer. And I think it has, you know, really, really big implications in terms of data we collect and, and how we're able to make better decisions based upon these, these, these new patterns. No, I, you're completely right. And I, I don't think we're going to go back to the way things were before. And I think we're going to going to have this interesting hybrid world of some of the way the world was a year ago will exist and some of the way the world is today. But we have learned we don't necessarily need to be in an office every day to be productive. We've learned that um, you can buy a lot more stuff online than we used to think we could. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And it's the, and I, there's so many companies that, I mean, this is a horrible situation and 
I see these interesting silver linings of so many businesses of all types have just changed their models and adapted really, really quickly. We had, um, we have a, a customer of IAIR that um, of the things that they do, they make ventilators and they used to make 30 ventilators a week and got this big government contract and they ended up and their CIO is just exceptional uh, digitized their manufacturing process, pulled together like a dozen ERPs because when you're doing 30 a week, you can pretty much count the number of ventilators. That's right. <laughs> but when you're doing 600 a day, you need a degree of rigor. You need all of your data. And they completely changed their manufacturing process to go from 30 a week to 600 a day. And they ended up having sensor data and pulling in more data to start to learn really quickly of, if the ventilator is at this setting, then this happens. And then patients are getting off ventilators faster. Well, great. Now that I have this data, what can I do to take that and farm that back out and tell that to other, other hospitals and care facilities that are using these products so we can keep getting better and learning faster? And um, it's so great to see how quickly they were able to pivot and adapt and yeah. have this really positive impact and to see what the power of having really good data and having the people internally to sort of make those changes and adjustments. Can That's right. Yeah. And to me, it comes back to this idea of the innovation and innovation mindset. You know, mm -hmm. If there is anything positive over the past uh, few you know, years, of our, our joint experiences, it's like, how do we take the innovation mindset forward and, and thinking about the new uses for data and, and really the power that we have to not just use data to, um, necessarily make better decisions, but to serve our customers better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, faster and and more in line with with their preferences. Um, and I think, you know, this hopefully will be one one positive outcome. And I think that this cloud journey uh, many of our customers are, are taking is really at its core an innovation journey. And, and the idea of, of, you know, in a highly competitive world, how do we make decisions better? And, and really this value of data and extracting you know, across many different sources and, and combining them, I think is really core to that innovation uh, journey as well. No, I, I totally agree. Um, so I want to ask you one more question. Uh, so I, I love this conversation about how you worked with AWS in a lot of ways to change business models and to think about towards the future, go towards the future and really drive innovation. Um, Outside of outside of your current role, uh, tell me another tell me another story, Greg. Tell me another story about a, a decision that you've had to make that was a really sort of challenging one. Sure, um, and this kind of goes back to my own uh, personal career. But as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I had been at um, Oracle, then I went to um, Intel uh, to you know lead our uh, business development at Intel around big data. And it turns out that I had a, an interesting customer I was working with uh, called AWS. And uh, this was again, you know, eight, you know, 2012 timeframe. And, you know, you know, Intel is a great company, you know, it was a, you know, I was really proud to uh, get hired at Intel. And I think we were doing, um, um, you know, really interesting work, but I just had this feeling, you know, that, that, Hey, there's something that to cloud computing that I was personally really interested in. And it just seemed to be, you know, the future of, of the way, you know, customers were going to deploy, you know, um, applications and computing power. And so, um, of course, it takes some convincing, you know, making a, a change between, you know, hey, you know, going to work for a bookseller and, you know, we had kind of used Amazon in our, our history, but, you know, it was, a, it was a bit of a risk, right? And, you know, my, my personal background is more, you know, the, the likes of Oracle and Intel and some of these. And so it was a bit of a, a leap of faith. Um, and, you know, obviously it's worked out, you know, well looking today backwards, but at the time it was, you know, a calculated risk, but, you know, if the saying goes, you know, luck is a preparation and opportunity, then I think I was certainly super lucky to, you know, really be like among a small team at AWS that thought about, you know, taking database as a service or analytics as a service to our customers and really helping driving that change as well. Uh, and that's, that's a big decision to make. And it's the, you're at Oracle, you're at Intel, you're at these big established companies that are, you know, obviously enterprise companies. 
And then, I mean, eight years ago, Amazon was a bookstore and you're like, I'm going to go work in enterprise and work on this cloud computing thing for a bookstore. And yeah, it, it was a, it was a definitely an interesting decision or discussion with my wife. And at the time, the kind of layer on top of it, we had uh, uh, two children under the age of two years. So our kids are 14 months apart. And so we had two, two babies at the time. And yeah, I'm going to go work for this company in Seattle. It was definitely, uh, but, you know, my uh, wife certainly, uh, you know, listened to my thought process and validated, hey, it sounds like a great opportunity. And, uh, you know, certainly it's worked out. And, and I think just this, um, this passion and excitement, which I still hold today after all these years, that just thinking about, you know, the success AWS has had, but, you know, at Amazon broadly, we think about this day one mentality, meaning that, you know, we want to think just like a startup, right? And, you know, if you think in terms of uh, the overall adoption of cloud computing, it's still still at its early days. And, you know, as, as excited as I am about the success our customers have had over the past eight years, what excites me the most is, is that next journey, right? And what does the next eight years bring? And really kind of bringing that and helping customers, you know, realize that transformation by adopting cloud computing and more broadly, you know, putting innovation and, uh, Decision making at the heart of their their business processes. I that's awesome, and I think I think everyone can learn from. I mean, I think everyone should aspire to have your luck, um, which I'm pretty sure is more than luck. But I think we can all learn from this: the idea of have an opinion and a perspective, and see see future trends, and see that you know what structured and unstructured data in two separate places doesn't make any sense. We we are one person. Uh, how do we bring this together? And the the what seems like a leap of faith to go work for a bookstore, but really is part of this much bigger trend. And look at the bigger trends that the world is going, and use that to start inform inform our decisions. Look at data, but it is an interesting lesson for everyone to uh, follow those macro trends and take a leap of faith. That's right. And I think uh, and the other point I would add to that is, you know, focus on on the end state. Like, what is it? What like don't think about the technology first. Like, think about what's the value I want to bring to my customers. You know, at Amazon broadly, we have a process we call working backwards, where if we have an idea, the first thing we do is we create the press release and the frequently asked questions. And we spent a lot of time iterating on like, what does that, what does that end state look like? What's that press release when we launch this? And that really helps us make sure that we're driving the right features, the right services to be able to help our customers. And so, you know, thinking about what's that press release internally or externally we launch, and then what's the architecture behind that, um, I think is a really a different way of, of getting value from that data. It helps make sure that we're delivering value at the end as well. I think I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Great, yeah. It's in, uh, and I'd encourage everyone if, you know, one of the most uh, um, interesting uh, yearly events I look forward to is Jeff Bezos's annual letter to shareholders. And, you know, yes, I am a, an Amazon employee and I have, you know, a shareholder, but at the same time, just as a, someone that's interested in how decision making is made and, you know, Jeff's letter to shareholders has always been a valuable um, insights for me. And I think it'd be uh, super valuable to kind of take a, a read if you haven't seen some of those in the past and learning about working backwards in a, in a culture of writing or decision making, what a day one mentality and in different business operating models. So what does it mean to be customer obsessed versus product obsessed or competitor obsessed? And of course, the value of being customer obsessed has all been you know great insights that I've, I've learned uh, from working at Amazon. And of course, you know um, something I hope to bring to our customers as well. Awesome. So I have a series of fun, exciting, quick hit questions for you that you haven't Great. even had to yet. Sure. Um, so what is a habit or hobby you've picked up during quarantine? Yeah, this one is, um, uh, and any of those who follow me on Instagram might, might follow this journey, but like one of the, the things that I'm really passionate about is uh, food and eating, <laughs> you could imagine, and being at home. And so one of the things I just, you know, I love is fresh bread for some reason has always just been, uh, and, you know, maybe this is new, it's kind of cliche that, hey, I took up baking, but uh, I actually took up uh, my baking bread. Okay, uh, next question. Um, what is one 
skill or talent that is not on your resume that we should know about? Um, one interesting thing is, uh, you know, I've always been a fairly, you know, um, I don't say athletic, but someone who enjoys the outdoors and, and a little bit of exercise. And uh, I also have a bit of, of um, obsessive compulsive disorder, perhaps, too. And so for some reason, I became obsessed with uh, triathlons and particularly the um, Ironman triathlon. And so which is interesting because I actually grew up in Ohio, not learning how to swim. And so when I was about 32 years old, I uh, just got in my mind, hey, I wanted to do an Ironman. And of course, the first thing was I had to learn how to swim, <laughs> which, you know, took about uh, 18 months or so, some lessons. Um, and then I ended up, uh, you know, being lucky enough to win a lottery entry to the uh, Ironman World Championships in Kona, Hawaii. And in uh, 2009, I actually uh, completed before midnight. And, you know, I'd read this before, but if you're not familiar with Ironman, they say, one of the greatest experiences in life is uh, running, you know, to the finish line um, in, in uh, Kona, Hawaii, uh, and being able to cross the line. I think that was certainly a, a super, you know, um, exciting highlight for myself, my, you know, personal life, but also, you know, just thinking about having uh, uh, conquered the Ironman is uh, certainly a um, something I'm pretty particularly proud of. Now, I wish I had more time to exercise, but I think that was a super exciting personal accomplishment as well. Oh, that's awesome. Um, how many have you done more triathlons? I have not. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, in the last few years, I guess I've fallen off. I, I did just recently order a Peloton. So I have big, big hopes to uh, become more athletic in 2021. Uh, but overall, I've, I've completed uh, two full Ironman triathlons, one in Hawaii, uh, one in Arizona, um, and the numerous half uh, triathlons. Uh, but many of these were a few years ago. So, uh, you know, one of the, my, my personal goals for 2021 is uh, uh, to leverage uh, data and analytics driven by Peloton to improve my fitness next year. That's awesome. Oh, and then last question. Um, what is one piece of advice that you have for business leaders? I think the one part is... Um, Thinking, coming back to this, like thinking about innovation and what are the, the, the operating models or assumptions that perhaps unknowingly limit how we think about innovation and, you know, being able to, to you know, break down those barriers, right? And not letting, you know, the past decision-making inhibit what we can do in the future. Of course, having a path to get there is super important planning, but, you know, removing or limiting you know, uh, the risk of failure as an operating model and really embracing that change, which I think, you know, helps drive that innovation. And, you know, many lessons can be learned from failure. I mean, hopefully they're less than successes, but without, you know, minimizing uh, the, the downside of failure, I think it'd be super hard to then drive innovation. And I think that's really the, the um, core to, I think, you know, of course, maybe perhaps the value cloud computing uh, brings in terms of being able to to quickly iterate on, on on different options to then find the right one, but you know innovation and, and risk taking, I think, are are core to you know being able to deliver more value and being successful. Awesome. No, that is fantastic, Greg. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. It has been a pleasure. And is a uh, if people want to follow you on social media, can they? Should they? I definitely yeah, want to I'm always happy to. I don't know how many photos of my cats and dogs and, and animals everyone would love to have, but uh, you can find me at uh, GregKH1 on, on Instagram and uh, Greg Corolla on Twitter. I'm awesome. happy to uh, let's connect with folks. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Truth Be Known is brought to you by Talent, a leader in data integration and data integrity. Talent enables every company to find clarity amidst the chaos. Talent Data Fabric brings together in a single platform all the necessary capabilities that ensure enterprise data is complete, clean, compliant, and readily available to everyone who needs it throughout the organization. Learn more at talent.com. That's T-A-L-E-N-D.com.